Welcome to the first week of Bayes Bible. We are so glad to have you here with us at the beginning of the church year, Advent. Now you know that at the beginning of the secular year, in January 1st, we have New Year's, the celebration of something new and unexpected. And in the case of this New Year's, that new and unexpected thing that we're waiting for might be the year 2021. We may not have ever thought that we would have gotten there, but perhaps we're actually going to get there, no matter how this year 2020 has gone. In the church year, at the beginning of the church year, in Advent, we are also waiting for something new and unexpected. The one who himself makes all things new, God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Now this is one of the big differences between the church year and the secular year. Because in the secular year, we start off the year with a celebration. With, hey, this new thing has come. But at the beginning of the church year, we actually begin with four weeks of anticipation for our celebration at Christmas. And in the secular world, we anticipate Christmas by seeing what new satanic cup design Starbucks is going to foist upon its customers this year. But in the church, we are anticipating not joy and presence, but God himself in the person of Christ Jesus. Now you may be wondering, how do we prepare for the arrival of God? Come on, man. You may not associate Christmas with thunder and lightning and fire and judgment, but this is precisely what we get in many of our passages during the Advent season. And it actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it for a moment. Let's say you have a friend whom you're very, very fond of. They've left a deep impression upon you. If you are anticipating them coming over to your house again, you might start to have memories of what they were like when they last came to see you. Well, so too in Advent, as we anticipate the arrival of God in the person of Christ Jesus, we remember what it was like when God previously came to his people. Now you might be saying to yourself at this point, how are we to anticipate the arrival of Christ at Bethlehem when it happened a long time ago? In fact, so long ago, it makes 2020 feel like it was short. Well, while we are remembering the first coming of Christ at Bethlehem, what is key to understand the entire season of Advent in the understanding of our church and its tradition is that Advent is not just when we commemorate the first coming of Christ. It is when we anticipate the second coming of Christ. I'll repeat. Advent is not just when we commemorate the first coming of Christ at Bethlehem. It is when we anticipate the second coming of Christ. In this week's passages, we're going to see how to prepare ourselves, our hearts, and our minds for the arrival of Christ into the world. And with that, let's begin. We begin Advent then with the book of the prophet Isaiah, who is often called the fifth evangelist. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Isaiah. Now Isaiah is often called the fifth evangelist because as St. Jerome, the famous 4th century Latin church father responsible for the translation of the Bible into Latin, often called the Vulgate, he says about Isaiah that Isaiah should be called an evangelist rather than a prophet because he describes all the mysteries of Christ and the church so clearly that you would think he is composing a history of what has already happened rather than prophesying about what is to come. Now in biblical scholarship, there's a little bit of a uh, debate about how the book of the prophet Isaiah has been composed. Chapters 1 to 39 very much appear to address the northern kingdom of Israel as they go into the Assyrian exile of the 8th century BCE. Whereas 
chapters 40 to 66 seem to very clearly address the southern kingdom of Judah as they are about to go into the Babylonian exile of the 6th century BCE. Our passage then, from chapter 64, is speaking to a people who have been decimated. Their streets have been cleared of people, their city utterly destroyed, and they are no longer able to gather for worship not because the temple is closed for health reasons, but because it's been destroyed. But what we get here in Isaiah is actually extremely bold. God, we want you to rip open the sky like wrapping paper. And we want you to light up the world like you did on Sinai. Don't you hear your people crying to you like they cried to you from Egypt? God, get your butt down here. But why? Why is God not present to us in the way that he used to be? See, we do something wrong or we sin, and then there's a natural consequence, a punishment that follows from that. But often when we're punished or we get the natural result of what our sin produces, we are led into despair. And in a state of despair, we often make foolish decisions and often commit more sin. It's a very, very cruel and vicious cycle. It is for this reason that the prophet Isaiah sees no other solution for the plight of his people than a direct visitation of God himself and intervention. Isaiah seems to be pretty down about us and our righteous deeds. In most translations, verse 6 is often read, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. Well, filthy cloth is a translation for nice people. The Hebrew, here's the Hebrew here, is idim, which are blood-soaked menstrual rags. You know, the traditional Christmas symbols of stars and snowmen and Christmas tree and tampons. Guess what you're getting in your stocking for this year? Isaiah's message then is that no matter what we do, we've been in a bad spot for a long time. We are at ground zero on 9-11. We are alone, wondering if we died, would anybody miss us? We are in a nursing home at the height of the pandemic. And no amount of national security Facebook posting, or face masks are going to take away the sense of dread and terror that we experience. We need a savior. We need God himself to come and visit us and remember that we are his people. We are then now preparing ourselves for the arrival of God by acknowledging ourselves as sinful and in need of a visit. Like Isaiah, this psalm is continually imploring God to help us. The New English translation of the Bible, the Net Bible, which is an extremely scholarly and valuable translation that I highly recommend to everyone who watches Bay's Bible. You could check out even their site, their study site, which I will put in a description. 
this translation translates let your face shine upon us as smile, smile upon us, show favor, smile upon us. Let's take a look at the Hebrew. Here is the Hebrew for verse 17, which you could see when you read from right to left. Now this is roughly translated in English to let your hand come upon the man of your right hand upon al ben adam upon the son of man which you have strengthened for yourself now normally son of man ben adam in hebrew just means a regular human being except in one place in the book of the prophet Daniel, chapter 7. This chapter, chapter 7 in the book of the prophet Daniel, is extremely important for the early Christians. For in chapter 7, Daniel has a vision of one like the Son of Man, who is going to receive an everlasting kingdom from the Ancient of Days, from God, that will destroy all the nations that have risen up against God's people. The Son of Man, then, is a title that Christ often uses of himself in the Gospels to refer to himself, referencing the prophecy of Daniel chapter 7. When the Church Fathers, then, read in this psalm, Upon the Son of Man whom you have strengthened for yourself, they immediately saw the coming of Christ to save us from our sins. We are in a world of darkness. We need the heavens to be ripped open and for Christ to descend and smile, smile, show favor on the world. If in Isaiah we have prepared ourselves for the arrival of God by evaluating ourselves as sinful and in need of a savior, our psalm response is simply saying this truth out loud. Now thus far, with the prophet Isaiah and with our psalm, we have been led into a place of desolation, darkness, sitting without God or hope in the world. But with our epistle, St. Paul is encouraging us that Christ had indeed come into the world and has left us with his Holy Spirit as we await for his coming again. St. Paul the Apostle his two letters to the church in Corinth can be very reliably dated from 50 to 53 CE, so about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And according to the Acts of the Apostles, St. Paul actually established the church in Corinth himself, so he knows them and their troubles very, very intimately. But for the purposes of our lectionary, we can actually read this passage as if it were addressed to us, the contemporary church, who are the extension of the apostles' original mission. And we are being encouraged here that despite this despair and the darkness and the ravages that our world has gone through, that Christ did indeed come the first time to save us from the punishment of our sins and that he will come again to save us from the presence of evil in the world. St. Paul is reassuring us that we have been given everything we need with Christ's Holy Spirit as we await for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Greek word here for revealing is apocalypsis, which is indeed the root of our word apocalypse. See, we normally think of the apocalypse, the second coming, as this really scary thing, and, and indeed it will be. But the first and foremost meaning of apocalypse, apocalypsis, is actually revealing, the unveiling, the showing forth. And this is what will happen at Christ's second coming, as we will see Christ in his full glory, and we will be revealed. It will be revealed to us who Jesus really is.
Now what is here where I begin to have a little bit of a problem with the way the lectionary is structured. Because you'll notice that the passage begins, but after those days, after that suffering. To which the natural follow-up question is, well, what days? And what suffering, exactly? And for this, we, we need a little bit of context. So at the very beginning of chapter 13, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus' disciples see the second temple. And they say, wow, that's so gorgeous. That's like, you know, this giant gold-plated hotel. It's just amazing. It looks so wonderful. And Jesus says, sorry, boys, but God is going to take down this temple, brick by brick, like a dad who has stubbed his toe one too many times on your Lego Star Wars set. So then, the disciples initially then ask afterward, well, when's that going to happen? And Christ, instead of giving a short, pithy saying, actually gives a well-thought-out response and timetable to tell them what will happen before the destruction of the second temple in Jerusalem. When we come to this passage then, Christ is describing what we would now call the Jewish War from 66 to 73 CE that was led by the Roman general Titus against the city of Jerusalem, leveled it to the ground, and tore the temple brick by brick. So when Christ says, this generation, he really meant it. It really was within 40 years of the lifetime of the disciples. However, these words, this generation shall not pass, have given great confusion to skeptics and scholars alike. C.S. Lewis, the 20th century Anglican Christian apologist, wrote in his essay, The World's Last Night. Say what you like, we shall be told. The apocalyptic beliefs of the first Christians have been proven to be false. It is clear from the New Testament that they all expected the second coming in their own lifetime. And worse still, they had a reason, and one which you will find very embarrassing. Their master had told them so. He shared and indeed created their delusion. He said in so many words, This generation shall not pass till all these things be done. And he was wrong. He clearly knew no more about the end of the world than anyone else. It is certainly the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. However, this verse is only embarrassing if you assume it is about the second coming of Christ and the end of the world, which clearly did not happen within the generation of the disciples. However, once it registers that this passage is not, I repeat, it is not about the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. It is about the destruction of the temple for its rejection of Jesus as their Messiah. Once you read this passage in that way, it becomes not a scare tactic that was overblown. It was not a false panic. It was not, oh, those disciples believed the world was going to end, and isn't it tragic how wrong they were? No. This actually becomes a very accurate prophecy about what would happen to Jerusalem if they rejected their Prince of Peace. So, with that caveat out of the way, let's begin to break down our passage just a little bit here. You'll notice at the beginning of this passage there is a quotation. This quotation is from our friend, the prophet Isaiah. Now, you may wonder, isn't this speak about the end of the space-time universe? Isn't this the world caving in on itself? Isn't this like a Doctor Who episode that has gone terribly, terribly wrong, and now the very fabric of reality is starting to fall apart? Not quite. See, this cosmic imagery is used throughout the Old Testament, not just in Isaiah, but in Ezekiel and in Amos. And each time that this cosmic imagery is used, it is used of past judgments that really did occur. Babylon, Egypt, and Israel herself. But how could this be the case? Well, in the Old Testament, and indeed throughout much of the Near East, 
imagery of the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars. These represented royalty. These represented political dynasties. The sun was a king, the moon a queen, the stars and the dignitaries. And this imagery is used throughout the Old Testament and used in much of the ancient world. What then is happening? The geopolitical universe is unraveling. And if you look throughout history, the rise and fall of empires are as drastic and as dangerous as comets and meteors. Now, what about this bit about the Son of Man coming in glory? Well, remember the book of the prophet Daniel, especially chapter 7, in, where, in which we were talking about when we were discussing our psalm. In that chapter, the Son of Man rides on the clouds, not descending to earth, but ascending into heaven. In other words, Christ's coming on the clouds of glory is not him coming down from heaven to judge the earth. It is about him rising up into heaven. What Christ is then saying is, at the destruction of the second temple, when the world around you is unraveling, the geopolitical universe has now changed forever, you will see Jesus in great power and glory ruling in heaven. And what is the posture that Christ asks of his disciples to which should be ready for him? To be awake, to be prepared, to be alert of the possibility of his return. It is this posture of always being ready for Christ's second coming that we are encouraged to adopt during this Advent season. Because as surely as Christ said that the temple would be destroyed. So too, is it certain that he will come again? Now to sum up, Advent is not just a time when we commemorate the first coming of Christ. It is the time when we anticipate the second coming of Christ. And as we've taken a look at our passages, there are four ways in which we prepare ourselves. We prepare our hearts and minds for the second coming. With Isaiah, we recognize our sinfulness and our need for a Savior. With our psalm, we beg God to smile upon us. With St. Paul, we are reminded and encouraged that God has left us his Holy Spirit, that we have not been left orphaned. And with our gospel, we are assured that Christ's word will be fulfilled and we are to be alert of its fulfillment.